We, as women, from the very first days of this republic, have helped in every way to build this country. We came ashore with our hopes and dreams for a better life, a new beginning. And at every step, we, as women, made our contributions. We were the mothers that bore and raised our children generation after generation. We were the wives that built homes and communities. We were workers that tilled the farmland, toiled in the factories. We were nurses and teachers. We celebrated our accomplishments with quiet pride and were there to help ease the pain with every tragedy. It was our hearts and our strength that sustained us. But because of our gender, because we were women, we were delegated to be second-class citizens. Despite all of our contributions and all of our efforts, we never had a seat at the table, never had the opportunity to contribute to our government. We never had a voice. But like all injustices anywhere, there comes a time when change begins, and it takes people of courage, vision, persistence, and commitment to make that happen. And so began the suffragist movement. And we continue that struggle today for respect and equality for all people, all our citizens. We are a force to be reckoned with. My dearest John, I long to hear that you have declared an independency. And by the way, in the new code of laws, which I suppose it will be necessary for you to make, I desire that you would remember the ladies and be more kind and favorable to them than your ancestors. Do not put such unlimited power into the hands of the husbands. Remember, all men would be tyrants if they could. If particular care and attention is not paid to the ladies, we are determined to foment a rebellion and will not hold ourselves bound by any laws in which we have no voice or representation. Adieu, John. I need not say how much I am your ever faithful friend, Abigail. Welcome. We are here with Jane Plitt, a visiting historian and activist in our own Sarasota community and Bradenton community. The first thing I would like to ask you, Jane, is this. Describe a woman in the 17th century. From what we know, they did not have many rights and it is why um, Abigail Adams, um, John's wife, pleaded with him to remember the women when they were writing the Constitution. Unfortunately, they didn't, and they left women and their rights out. Which brings us to the whole issue of women's suffrage and equality. I cannot choose my own husband without my father's permission. I cannot own property or handle my own money. I cannot have a job without my husband's permission. I cannot get a divorce. I cannot manage any property or business. 
I cannot inherit what is mine. I cannot have my own home if my husband dies. And if my husband dies, I cannot be the legal guardian of my own children. You often compare uh, the indigenous peoples with their versions of equality to the American version. Lest we get stuck, this is a whole worldwide vision. What was that like? Can you, can you give us the differences as these pioneers were establishing, stealing America, what they were finding? Well, particularly in upstate New York, there was the Iroquois Confederation, and the Seneca Indians had a very different approach um, illustrated by marriage. So when a um, Seneca man married his wife, he moved in to his wife's lodging. Um, and the women of the tribe would choose the chief, who would be male, and they also had the right to pull him from power should they think he was less than effective. That was not the way white Western people operated. With marriage, um, from two became one, and the one was male, who had full economic, political, and social power over their wives at the highest level and at the lowest level. Um, women did not have custodial rights, they had no property rights, and they were basically limited by whatever their father or husband decided, because they had the power. And that deeply affected um, the two prime leaders, Lucretia Mott and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, who were from the Seneca Falls area, upstate New York, and they saw this contrast. Why don't we have the rights of a human being? And it was simply because they were women. So they came back to America with that knowledge. And then they're observing their Seneca sisters and seeing uh, life can operate differently. And the power relationship that we're operating in um, the United States was not equal. So in 1848, these two ladies over tea um, decided to call the um, Seneca Falls Women's Rights Convention. Two of the people who came were Frederick Douglass from Rochester, New York, and Amy Post, a Hicksite radical Quaker, endorsed this platform that Elizabeth Cady Stanton presented, including the possibility that women, this was revolutionary, should have the right to vote. And as I understand it, that was very low on the list, like number 12 or 13. They didn't even think they could get to it. They didn't think it was a possibility. It seemed so far-fetched, like that it would be something outrageous to do. Well, they knew how controversial it would be, and therefore they weren't going to hit it first. They were politically savvy, but yes. So it did pass, but two weeks later, the meeting continues in Rochester, New York, and there's a huge fight over who should chair the meeting because M Mott and Stanton want a man who did chair the original meeting. But Amy Post, that radical, insists it has to be a woman, and she wins. So there is this, how much do you push and how much do you shake the bushes in terms of what will be accepted by society? And then you have Alice Paul and leading a much more radical approach. He has her 200 silent sentinels who are chaining themselves to the White House gates. They are um, uh, sent to jail, they're fasting and the like, and it was only that militancy that we also see similar in other civil rights groups um, that mobilized and showcased and finally got President Wilson to endorse um, the 
uh, amendment and it does finally pass. And it only took 72 blasted years for women to get the right to vote. But it didn't apply to all women. And the thing that I'd like to emphasize is the suffrage movement was far more than suffrage. Um, you've got Elizabeth Cady Stanton writing the Women's Bible in 1894. She is rethinking the whole way society is viewing women. You've got Susan B. Anthony saying every woman needs her own pocketbook. She understood that suffrage was just a really a small part of, of full equality. Will you set up for us uh, Sojourner Truth's entrance into her famous public speech? And here came this woman who spoke, and for many, a woman speaking first was radical, and then you had someone who had been a slave speaking, which is such an act of courage and bravery. Totally, and, and she just physically is such a presence. Mm -hmm. She is large, she's not petite, and she is assertive. And God bless, God bless. Well, children, well, there's so much racket, there must be something out of kilter. I think that twixt the Negroes of the South and the women at the North all talking about rights, the white man will be in a fix pretty soon. But what's all this to talk about? That man over there, he say women need to be helped into carriages and lifted over ditches and have the best place everywhere. Well, ain't nobody ever helped me into no carriages, lifted me over no mud puddles or give me the best of anything. And ain't I a woman? Look at me. Look at my arm. I've plowed and planted and gathered into barns and no man can head me. Ain't I a woman? I could work as much and eat as much as any man when I could get it and bear the lash as well. Ain't I a woman? I've born 13 children and see most of them sold off into slavery. And when I cried out with my mother's grief, none but Jesus heard me. And ain't I a woman? Sometimes. I feel like a motherless child. Sometimes I feel like a motherless child. Sometimes I feel like a motherless child. A long, long way from home. We can't imagine life without that speech. I don't think we can imagine the movement without that speech. It would have been a teacup movement. It brought the ground in and the reality and the truth of women. Yes, absolutely. So. Um, and as I pointed out, just because the white women were able to vote, women of color were not. And, you know, we need to understand while we're celebrating that we have a hundred years of the right to vote, that's not all women. I think uh, that's a wonderful place for us to end. And is there any parting thoughts that you would like to share on the importance of voting? My son was um, a diplomat in Africa, and when one of the countries um, enabled all people to vote, he witnessed the people stood in the heat of Africa for three days and three nights because they were determined to vote. When we rem remember that kind of powerful scene, it should make all of us feel blessed that we have the right to vote and we need to use that right to vote.
it is inherently a responsibility. If you are、um, a citizen in this country, you should be voting, and you should know who you're voting for and why. Thank you, Jane. The power of the vote is the power of our word and our purpose as a human being. And the suffragists—they tell us that loud and clear across the centuries. In the year of our Lord, 1916, the 14th of October, sisters of the West, may we count on you. How can our nation be free with half of its citizens politically enslaved? Women of the West, stand by us in this crisis. Give us your help, and we shall win. Fight on our side, and liberty shall be for all of us. For the first time in the world, women are asked to unite with women in a common cause. Will you stand by? It's only for a little while. Soon the fight will be over. Victory is in sight. It depends on how we stand in this coming election. United or divided, whether we shall win and whether we shall deserve to win. Together, we will stand shoulder to shoulder for the greatest principle the world has ever known: the right to self-government. We have no money, no elaborate organization, no one interested in our success except anxious-hearted women all over this country who cannot come to the battle lines themselves. Women of these states, unite! We have only our chains to lose, and a whole nation to gain. Welcome. We're here at Florida Studio Theater, my home and、uh, my artistic home, with Richard Hopkins, the CEO and artistic director of the theater, and a colleague for many, many years. I think the first question I want to ask, and I think we all want to know, is why the theater took on this project.、Uh, why the theater took on the project? Well, I heard a, a friend, Jane Plitt, told me. A couple of years ago, that the centennial of the suffragist, the women's right to vote, was coming up in 2020, and I started thinking about it. I immediately went home and did a thorough research in Google, <laughs> which took about three minutes, and realized this is a great project. This is a great project because it it captures、uh, all that is America. 
the good, the bad, and the ugly. It captures it all to me. Uh, the, the, the women working so hard to get the right to vote and people against it, women against it, men against it, uh, the, the, the African Americans that were with it and moving forward with it at the time and then were sort of betrayed by part of the movement. It, 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 it's just politics and it's Americana at its essence. So I thought it was great. And it's important that the women have had the right to vote now for 100 years. It's a dramatic story in and of its own. It, 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 is, it is a dramatic story. It's, it, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a great story. So it's great uh, for theater. And there's a, there, there's a lot in it that the theater can mine. It's filled with stories. It's not one story, it's, it's thousands of stories. But uh, we have four playwrights working on it and uh, they're coming up with great stories themselves. One is called Eleanor, about Eleanor Roosevelt by Mark St. Germain. Mark is a good history writer and it's a great portrait of Eleanor. You get to see her in her own right and how much she influenced Franklin. I mean, she was the first woman, she was the first first lady to step out and make speeches and have a political agenda, agenda of her own. And that was significant. She was a big, she, she was a big social fighter and, and, and did all the right things. I mean, what the suffragists did was question the past. They questioned existing law. It was against the law for women to vote. So they questioned the existing law. Most of the great advances in human history come from revolutions of one sort or another. And uh, this was a long fought uh, revolution for women to get the right to vote. I'd like to move to the theater's place in the community. Many people think theater is entertainment or art is just entertainment, it's for play. This theater has a deep mission for community. What do you see as this theater's mission in a community? There's a certain innate questioning in theater by its very nature, and there always has been since its inception 2,500 years ago in ancient Greece. Whether it was Antigone uh, or Oedipus, there was questioning going on, questioning the values of society, questioning our individual rights, uh, questioning our relationship to each other, our relationship to, to society, our relationship to nature or to God. And the neat thing about it is that if you really engage the audience in issues that are of import of the day, then that audience member has an investment in. It's like investing in stocks, or it's like investing in buying a car. You have, you're invested in that and you care about it, and it's a much more important as a result. It's no accident that theater is still alive today, 2,500 years later, doing almost exactly the same thing that actors were doing 2,500 years ago. That suggests to me that it's not some fuddy-duddy art form, quite the opposite, that something that's lasted for 2,500 years is probably a vital necessity to our society. And I think it is. Uh, I think that we put things on the table for our community and for our audience. We, we put important issues on the table all day, every day, but we're not afraid to entertain at the same time. And my favorite kind of challenge is a challenge that is funny and entertaining and very enjoyable, but at the same time makes me go home and rethink my values. Please do not think of me as old fashioned. I pride myself on being an up-to-date woman. I believe in all kinds of broad-minded things, only I do not believe in woman suffrage because to do so would be to deny my sex. If the women are enfranchised, they will desert their homes, neglect their families, and spend all their time at the polls. Let me speak one word to my sister friends who are here today. Women, we don't need the vote to get our way. If you want a thing, tease. If that won't work, nag. And if that won't do, cry. Crying always brings them around. Get what you want. Pound on pillows, make a scene, make home a hell on earth, but do so in a womanly way. It, it, it comes down to this. Someone must wash the dishes. Now, I know I am but a rib, and so I wash the dishes. 
or I hire another rib to do so for me. It all amounts to the same thing. And how can I picture for you the day after the election? Death and divorce will rage unchecked. Crime and contagious disease shall bridle throughout the land. My friends, my friends, I feel so strongly about this that I, I, I can not think. I don't want you to talk. I want you to listen. You do not yet understand my view on the question of the suffrage. Now, I must preface my remarks by reminding you that the suffragette movement is essentially a dowdy movement. Now, not all of the suffragettes are dowdies, but they are mainly supported by dowdies. Now, I am not a dowdy. Oh, no compliments. It's easy to read your thoughts. I am one of those women who are accustomed to rule the world through men. Man is ruled by beauty, by charm, and the men who are not have no influence. The Salic law, which forbade a woman to occupy the throne, was founded on the fact that when a woman is on the throne, the country is ruled by men and therefore ruled badly. Whereas when a man is on the throne, the country is ruled by women and therefore ruled well. The suffragettes would degrade women from being rulers to being voters, mere politicians, the drudge of the caucus and the polling booths. We would lose our influence completely in such a state of affairs. The New Zealand woman has the vote, and what is the result? No poet ever made a New Zealand woman his heroine. One might as well be romantic about New Zealand mutton. And look at the suffragettes themselves. Hmm? The only ones who are popular are the pretty ones who flirt with mobs the way ordinary women flirt with officers. Thank you. <laughs> is, this a, is this the way we want to raise our adults in the future? Uh, it makes good plays ask those kind of questions and send us to those. And that's what the Suffragist Project does, I think, because it is so Americana. It has, it's, feel, it's got bad guys and good guys. Uh, and the bad guys were the guys who were against it, and the good guys were the guys who were for it. But that's in retrospect. That's historically. Because what I try to do is identify with the guy that you perceive as a bad guy today and say, hmm, I might have thought that way back then. And if I might have thought the way the so-called bad guy thought back then, the guy who was against women's right to vote, what might I be thinking today that 200 years from now will be seen as bad? You know, it's easy to look at slavery 200 years ago as something that was really bad, 300 years ago as something that was really bad. But a lot of people didn't. They were all complicit in making that happen. So what are we doing today that we are all complicit in making happen that 200 years from now, people are going to look at us and say, man, they were barbaric. There's a lot to be learned from studying history, and there's even more to be learned from studying history through, through a theatrical lens because it, it brings the conflicts to a boil. It's usually a few people find the truth, and then it takes time and work to spread that truth around to others to get them, oh, maybe that is true, because they thought it was a lie. They thought the idea of women voting, they didn't think that was going to be good or true to American values. I have a photograph of the women from 1917 standing on this front lawn, three years before they had the right to vote. Mm -hmm. a photograph of these women standing out there on the front lawn, getting ready to go protest and boycott stores downtown because they weren't letting all the kids go to school. There they were with their signs and everything, getting ready. And they built this building. The women built this building. In 1915, this building was built by women right here in Sarasota when all the roads were dirt. You can actually feel the ghosts. Just feels, you feel the whole spirit. They were the first su suffragists in the city. The yeah. first voting happened here. Yeah. Yeah. So we're in a historic, incredible place. Yeah. The community has responded in, in an amazing way to this project. Yeah. Over 60 organizations 
have jumped on board. And we are in the midst of a pandemic at this time, right. as they were in 1920. What has been most surprising to you about the community's reaction? I was surprised by the outpouring of people, I think, who, who got on board really quickly and that it just took off like a flash fire uh, throughout the community and, and those 60 organizations piled on. Uh, that was fantastic, I think. And I think when I put the uh, offer out to playwrights, they were excited. Oh, this is an opportunity. This is something interesting, good to write, because there are parallels from then to now because what was going on 100 years ago is going on today. We're only using different words and we've, we, have, we have grown, we've grown, it's, it's better, but we still have growing to do. And that's the nature of humanity, uh, is, is continual march forward. If you look back on the history of plays, they're always dealing with that. They're dealing with the struggle to help others, the struggle to bring others up, to the, the, the people who are, uh, disenfranchised, pushed to the outside for whatever reason, whether it's what they look like, how tall they are, color of their hair, color of their skin, uh, sexual orientation, all of the reasons that people are seen as different and are pushed away from the center. Uh, I think one of the great things that theater has done is to encourage everyone to come to the center and the suffragist movement and the women's movement is a shining example of how positive that can be. For the first time in our history, women have the power with which to enforce their demands and the weapons with which to fight for women's liberation. Let no party dare to slur the demands of women. Liberty must be fought for. Women of this nation, this is the time to fight. It is women for women now and shall be until our fight is won. How can our nation be free with half of its citizens politically enslaved? Give us your help and we shall win. Victory, Victory is in sight. sight. To pass, the amendment needs 36 eyes. At this time, there are 35. The last state to vote is Tennessee. What say you? My name is Harry T. Burns, and I am a state legislator in the great state of Tennessee. On the eve of the vote for the ratification of the 19th Amendment, I received a letter from my mother, which I read on the floor of the state legislature. Dear son, hurry and vote for suffrage and don't keep them in doubt. I noticed Chandler's speech, it was very bitter. I have been waiting to see how you stood but have not seen anything yet. Don't forget to be a good boy and help Mrs. Cat with her rats. Is she the one that put rat in ratification? No more from Mama this time. With lots of love, Mama. The great state of Tennessee was the final vote in the ratification of the 19th Amendment. When death sunders our nearest ties, alone we sit in the shadows of our afflictions, in ignorance, poverty, or vice, as a pauper or a criminal. Alone we steal or starve. Alone we are hunted in the byways and highways. Alone we stand in the judgment seat. Seeing then that life must ever be a march and a battle, it is the height of cruelty to rob from the individual a single human right. I remember once when crossing the Atlantic, when I went up on the deck of the boat at midnight, and a dense black cloud rolled in and enveloped the sky. And the mighty deep was roaring, lashed by the winds. 
my feeling was not of danger or fear. My feeling was of uncontrollable devastation and loneliness. A little spark of life shut in by a tremendous darkness. Such is the individual life. Who then, I ask you, may take, dare take, away from another human being the rights, the duties, the responsibilities of another human soul? I just think we're going through another, re, another sort of suffragist movement. It's, we're going through the 21st century movement of that and taking women up to the next level that gets closer to equal. Um, and then someday we'll recognize that when that equality has occurred that women have strengths that men don't have. And I think Understanding that the suffragist movement is about our rights as human beings and our rights to determine our lives. And the theater asks, at least that's what I'm getting, the theater asks us to be human, to be vital, to be exposed, to be ourselves, and to put ourselves at the table of life. ago, on the cusp of this uh, centennial, Brent Staples in the New York Times had an opinion that said, the suffragist betrayal of black women. It was a wake-up call that while we're celebrating, we have to also honor the journey of struggle that happened and the prices that were paid and a betrayal toward all of the African-American suffragists that were right there at the beginning. I think what's really important about this whole anniversary of the suffragette movement is to look at the history because some of it is not very pleasant. Some of it is downright disgusting for black women like me. One of the things I think is very important is for us to look at our history because our history has lessons that are not being taught today but need to be. For example, it took years and activism to get black women recognized and to listen to what they were saying about their own humanity and also the actions of the black women themselves. There were those like Ida B. Wells and Mary Church Terrell and so many others for generations. 
they fought to be recognized. And that's why the history is so important because although it points to a time in our society where white women did not recognize the humanity of black women and did not advocate for them, during the March on Washington, when all of the women who were involved in the suffragette movement were marching for the right to vote, the white suffragettes pushed the black women to the back. But there was one who just did not appreciate being treated as a second-class citizen. And so it was Ida B. Wells who went to the front. And as we used to say back in the Civil Rights Movement, she wasn't going to let nobody turn her around. So she walked to the front of that line to say, I am here and you are going to recognize me and the rights that I and my sisters have. That is a ferocious act of bravery. Years ahead of its time, even in the civil rights struggle, to be in a march and be alone and demand to go right to the front. The history is important for everybody to know and understand and to appreciate the struggles that everybody waged, including white people on our behalf. But there was something in our history, in our DNA, they kept on keeping on to get the rights that they fundamentally believed was due to them. I just can't stress enough the importance of everybody knowing this history. We knew the names of Sojourner Truth. We knew the names of Mary McLeod Bethune. We knew the names of all of the women who, even Phyllis Wheatley going back, a poet who though, though enslaved, wrote the most beautiful poetry. So when challenges come in our current environment, People can understand the reaction and how we are not going to take it anymore. We have to continue to fight because the struggle continues. And so that's why the fight that these black suffragettes waged is so important to our history today, because it's really about recognizing the humanity of people. In this instance, it happened to be the black suffragettes, but it's a bigger impact because it says, look at all of us in all of our humanity. And I can't stress enough how important that history is today when we have so many challenges that say, wait a minute, we are not realizing the dream of this country. If you were going to talk to a 10-year-old girl today or your 10-year-old self, what benediction would you give her? What prayer? What would you tell her? So what I think I would tell a young 10-year-old, especially today because they have so much access that, that I didn't have, although I had a lot of access, is to go wherever you go to study and read your history and learn about the ways in which the pioneers, the women pioneers, withstood all kinds of abuse and yet they kept on keeping on. And, and what that history will give is a layer of armor, armor that enables you to confront whatever challenges built out of that history that says you can defeat challenges that don't recognize you as a full human being. Those words are so spiritually beneficial to every young girl that walks forward into the future. I want to thank you for being here. Since you're talking about incredible strength, I would like to ask you to read a passage from 1866. Well, first of all, thank you for having me. I'm very happy to accommodate you when I read this piece that is so appropriate and so relevant, so timely. It, it has no, it has a beginning, 
but it has no end because it continues to be relevant to these days and will be to days in the future. So it goes like this. When the hands of the black were fettered, white men were deprived of the liberty of speech and the freedom of the press. Society cannot afford to neglect the enlightenment of any class of its members. At the South, the legislation of the country was in behalf of the rich slaveholders, while the poor white man was neglected. What is the consequence today? You white women speak here of rights, I speak of wrongs. I, as a colored woman, have had in this country an education which has made me feel as if I were in the situation of Ishmael, my hand against every man and every man's hand against me. Are there no wrongs to be righted? In advocating the cause of the colored man, since the Dred Scott decision, I have sometimes said I thought the nation had touched bottom. But let me tell you, there is a depth of infamy lower than that. It is when the nation, standing upon the threshold of a great peril, reached out its hands to a feebler race and asked that race to help it. And when the peril was over, said, you are good enough for soldiers, but not good enough for citizens. I think that so many of us, you know, listen to words that were not written particularly for African Americans or African American women, but the moral arc of the universe is long, but it bends towards justice. I wanted when asked to be a part of this was I wanted to really represent resilience and not only the parallel of what the entire world is feeling right now but what women have had to do time and time again and what we'll continue to have to do until we really reach a true point of equality is that sense of being able to pick ourselves up and keep going uh, so I think behind this there's a lot of hope there's struggle, there's um, a sense of pride and drive to move forward and go beyond um, where we are and push beyond our comfort to really get to the place that we deserve. as artists that we have a real duty to use our platform for good and to talk about things that are difficult because we have a way to bring audiences in to experience something outside of themselves but that resonates with them uh, so that they can use the perspective of someone or something else to sort out their own thoughts and feelings and struggles before they have to really take them into the world on their own. Good morning. We are here with the legendary Sonia Fuentes, author, 
feminist and activist who's been involved for much of the 20th century and well into now the 21st century. I'm so grateful to have her with us. Hi, Kate. It's a pleasure to be with you today. Thanks, Sonia. I'd like to first start out with this question. You are one of the probably very few, if not only few, women today who actually touched history, who actually had an experience and met the legendary Alice Paul, uh, uh, hallmark in the early suffragist movement. Can you tell us a little bit about what she did and then your experience with her? Well, Alice Paul was a founder of the National Woman's Party, which exists to this day and has its headquarters on Capitol Hill in Washington, D.C. She was, uh, has been described as one of the most charismatic figures to come out of the suffrage movement. I knew her because I served on the board of trustees for the National Women's Party for many years. And she was uh, one of a million uh, with regard to devoting her life to securing suffrage. And when it was secured, she then drafted the ERA with someone else and spent the rest of her life working for that. She also spent time in Geneva where she founded the World Woman's Party, uh, working with the League of Nations also to secure women's rights. All of the suffragists inspire me. Uh, what they went through so that we today could vote is just incredible to me. Uh, I have spent 55 years of my life fighting for women's rights, but I never exposed myself to any physical discomfort or danger. Uh, these women picketed the White House. They were called silent sentinels. They were arrested and put in the District of Columbia jail and the Okaquan workhouse in Virginia. There was one night there when it was called the Night of Terror, when the order was given to terrorize these women and they were beaten with clubs and one of them had a heart attack and they were force fed when they went on a hunger strike. Uh, there is no, and the conditions at the two places where they were kept the D.C. jail and the Okaquan workhouse were horrendous. Their food was filled with worms, their open toilets, and it was just horrendous. And these were women of quality. And uh, to me, especially the force feeding was horrendous when they uh, announced that they were going to starve uh, or fast, they were force fed. As a part of the Silent Sentinels, we had been protesting outside of the White House for months. On the night of November 14th, 1917, after peacefully protesting all day in the freezing cold which seeped into our bones, we were arrested and taken to prison for no other reason than peaceful assembly. On the terrible night of November 14th, they dragged us to jail. And threw us into dark, filthy cells. They force fed us. They tied us with bonds around our legs, necks, chests, then the doctors and warders held us down and forced a tube five or six feet long, about the size of a finger, through our nostrils to our stomachs. They shackled my arms to the top of the cell, forcing me to stand all night. Then they slammed my arm down onto a iron bench twice. My head was smashed against an iron bed. I lost consciousness. They called that terrible night the night of terror. The night of terror. 
the night of terror. Alice Paul was force fed not only in the United States, but she had also gone to England and worked with the leading suffragists there. The Pankhurst uh, mother, Emmeline Pankhurst, and her daughters, Sylvia and Christabel, she was force fed in England in Holloway Prison in London. So uh, all of these women are inspiring to me. A leading one, Inez Milholland. Uh, she gave her life for suffrage. She was a woman who was 30 years old at the time that she died. Uh, she was married. She was a lawyer. She was well known for going at the front of suffrage parades on a white horse. And on one occasion she became ill and she was scheduled to give a speech and was told not to because she was ill. And she went anyway gave the speech for suffrage, and died shortly thereafter. Gave her life for suffrage. That is an incredible sacrifice. And here today, we take it almost for granted, oh, we can go out and vote. But to realize that people gave their lives for that vote and their health um, with the forced feedings, that's remarkable. It's mind-blowing to me, and I've known it for many, many years, and I, I still can't get over it. When I read the details of the forced feeding, it was just something horrendous. And Alice Paul, at one time, they put her in the psychiatric ward of the D.C. jail, and she couldn't sleep at night because they would shine a light on her face uh, periodically so that she could not sleep. Uh, you're talking about the silent sentinels and there is Woodrow Wilson in the White House and very early he was against the suffrage movement. What do you know about that? Well, uh, the women, uh, Alice Paul and other women kept meeting with him and asking him for his support, which he did not give. But Alice Paul learned a technique when she worked with the Pankhurst in England and that was that when it comes to anybody in political office, no matter what his position on anything, if he is not a supporter of suffrage, we will fight against him. So that, Alice Paul came back with that philosophy that she learned in England. And from then on, she and all her co-workers knew that when there was any politician involved, if he didn't support suffrage, they would work against him. So they worked against Wilson. Uh, what finally caused him to change his mind, other than their persistence, I don't know, but he eventually changed his mind. That is the great mystery of the 20th century, I think. What was that genesis? My guess would be that he saw they weren't going away. Uh, they kept going and eventually, he, that's why he did it, I would think. I'd like to end today with um, a question for you. Where do we need to go from here? Well, when I give talks, I, I end them with a list of 20 things that need to be done in the United States for women, and then another smaller list which includes those and adds on things that need to be done in other countries. But um, we just need to keep doing what we've been doing and hitting at every time we find a case of discrimination. It goes on all the time. Just about every field you mention, still, there are many things to be done. It's still so ingrained in us, isn't it? Uh, yeah, the, because the it's not, it, as, as time goes, if, if, I, if I was alive before we had any changes in, in women's rights, you can see that this is a fairly recent development and uh, what we've accomplished is mind-blowing to me. Uh, when we started now, the National Organization for Women, we didn't have such grandiose ideas. We didn't expect to revolutionize this country and the world as has been happening. So we've created a revolution, but there's much, much more to be done, and many young women and men will do it. And if there's one thing you would say, if you could talk to them right now, the young men and women who are joining that 
struggle still, what would you say? Continue the fight. We have to continue the fight. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. He has loosed the fateful lightning of his terrible swift sword. His truth is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. As women, we know that over the last 100 years, so much has changed. As women, we have overcome so many challenges and have suffered heartbreak and disappointment. As women, we have also celebrated our successes and taken joy in our achievements. As women and voters, we are a force to be reckoned with, for we are the heirs to the legacy of the suffragists. We look back at the bravery and determination of those women and know that without their courage, their vision, and their purpose, our right to vote may have taken even longer. But now, things have changed. Our voices are heard. Our presence is felt. Our purpose is clear. Our votes count. And to all the suffragists who led the way, we say a heartfelt thank you to all the dangerous ladies.